In the summer of 2009, I was cast as the aura-sensitive flower child, Jeannie, in a production of Hair at the Chance Theater in Anaheim. Like many a theater kid, I became obsessed with the show in my high school years, especially after seeing a local black box production stage managed by my father. He was a regular in the Los Angeles theater scene, eager to devour everything about this musical so unlike the shows I grew up with. My mother allowed me to record her LP of the original Broadway cast onto a cassette tape so I could blast it on my Walkman 24-7. When I was cast in an actual production over a decade later, I decided to immerse myself in the world of the late 60s even further, growing my hair long and committing to the show's infamous nude scene. Thank you very much. Hair is frequently performed by small theaters and colleges, and with every production, the ensemble is given the moniker of Tribe. My production was no different, and we were the Hinoon Tribe. And a major part of our rehearsal process was growing together as an ensemble. Having spent my life as a theater kid, I was frankly surprised how much the process of ensemble is baked into hair. As Jeannie, I made my grand entrance wearing a gas mask, being pushed around on a metal staircase while I greeted the audience with lyrics directly addressing air pollution. In that moment, I reflected how little this experience had in common with where I was 10 years earlier, playing Grandma Title in my 1999 high school production of Fiddler on the Roof. But was it really that different? After all, Hare came to Broadway in 1968, a mere four years after Fiddler on the Roof. And while my production was an arts high school one, Josh Groban was our Tevya, thank you very much again. But we announced it grandma. We still utilized many of the same techniques used in hair. Our beloved US history teacher played the rabbi and being Jewish himself, he was able to teach our entire cast the history of why the traditions presented in the musical were so important. Fiddler requires the cast to be a unified ensemble for the piece to work, so we became our own little village. And like hair with the song Aquarius, there is an overarching concept that is apparent from the opening number, tradition. Heck, my big moment as Grandma Title took place in a surreal dream sequence, and I got to be just as weird 10 years later in Hare's infamous LSD scene. Ensemble-based theater, breaking the fourth wall, a clear concept, popularity with both colleges and regional theaters alike. All are present in both of these 1960s musicals, yet they are perceived as existing in two different worlds. By the 1960s, the popularity of the American musical was waning. The 1940s and 50s are renowned as the golden age of Broadway, when musical theater began to take an integrated form, referring to the way the songs are integrated into the plot, and resulted in the modern book musical. Golden age musicals were heavily structured, with song and dance all working in service of telling a compelling and coherent story, rather than churning out frivolous entertainment. Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein II did it first with the musical Oklahoma in 1943, and many other smashed musicals with the same formula would follow suit, like On the Town, South Pacific, Guys and Dolls, and The Music Man. I have videos about both Rodgers and Hammerstein and the Golden Age of Broadway, so I'll link them down below if you want to check them out. Throughout the 1950s, original Broadway cast recordings topped the charts, and the creeping influence of rock and or roll was brushed off by Broadway songwriters as a mere fad. They were uh, mistaken on that front, <laughs> for as the 1960s rolled in, Broadway music drifted off the charts as rock, pop, Motown, and folk took its place. The Golden Age formula that had at one time seemed so revolutionary was growing stale. For example, the musical Camelot opened in December 1960, and what should have been a hit for the creative team and leading lady of My Fair Lady instead symbolically killed the Golden Age musical in one fell swoop. 
Considering that Camelot's title song was adopted as the unofficial anthem of the Kennedys, there is the added irony that Broadway seemed to be completely irrelevant by President Kennedy's assassination in 1963. In an era known for the civil rights movement, feminist movement, college protests, the Vietnam War, the counterculture hippie movement, socially conscious music, and the rampant use of experimental drugs, Broadway seemed to be actively avoiding the zeitgeist of the 1960s. Which brings us to today. You know, I am a 30... <coughs> oh, sorry. I am a 30... <laughs> year old uh, performing arts teacher who's gone back to grad school with the pipe dream of becoming a musical theater historian. 38. During my research for this video, I knew I wanted to talk about a transitionary Broadway era, and I was continually drawn to the 1960s. The more I re-listened to the original cast albums, flipped through scripts, and combed through Tony Awards footage on YouTube, the more I began pondering the question, how and why did Broadway musicals evolve in the 1960s? What was it about this era in particular that allowed Broadway to take such risks? There were the obvious game changers like Hair, but also ones I hadn't even really thought of as game changers in the first place, like Fiddler on the Roof. With Broadway no longer needing to impress a world audience anymore, its creatives were able to go back to basics, crafting new musicals with a focus on the art ahead of the commerce. After all, Broadway musicals bounced back in a major way in the 1970s, both commercially and creatively, and that couldn't have come out of nowhere. So, it is my thesis that Broadway musicals of the 1960s were unencumbered by the demands of Golden Age Broadway and were therefore able to experiment with structure, style, and tone, thus laying the groundwork for trends that would become apparent in the decades to follow. With regards to the musical theater structure itself, there are three topics I'll be focusing on for the purposes of this video. First, there were the concept musicals, shows that were written to convey an idea rather than a plot. Second, and working hand in hand with the development of concept musicals, were the Broadway auteurs, often director choreographers, whose involvement became all encompassing in the 1960s. Third, there were the new musicals being created outside the Broadway bubble, off Broadway, off off Broadway, and beyond. This video will be laid out by topic as there is plenty of bleed over between the subjects, with some musicals falling into multiple categories. And this is created for the purpose of revealing certain trends rather than a chronological recounting of events. While many musicals will be mentioned, and certainly a plethora of musicals could be discussed, I'm going to focus on the following 60s musicals that were successful at the time, both critically and financially, while still remaining culturally relevant and popular today. Cabaret, Fiddler on the Roof, Man of La Mancha, Hair, Bye Bye Birdie, Hello Dolly, Sweet Charity, The Fantastics, and Oliver. There are also numerous important figures who will be discussed, but particular focus is paid to director-choreographers Bob Fosse, Jerome Robbins, and Gower Champion, director-producer Hal Prince, and the songwriting teams of Kander and Ebb, Bach and Harnick, and Schmidt and Jones. I'm going to be using footage from Tony Awards performances and uh, movie versions, but know that for the majority of this video, I'm gonna be focusing on the original stage productions for all the shows discussed. So sorry to Bob Fosse's cabaret. Finally, this video is not necessarily breaking new ground. As many historians I consulted have presented the ideas I'll be laying out. The works of musical theater historians Larry Stemple and Ethan Morden were both influential in my research, as well as the musicals from this decade that have entire books devoted to their histories. However, my hope is to consolidate their findings in a digestible way that focuses specifically on the decade of the 1960s rather than on Broadway history as a whole. It is my goal to add my voice to the historiography on this era, pinpointing specific moments trends that made 60s musicals different than what came before and influential on what would come after. For footnotes, just check the description below. Concept musicals. The term concept musical can be traced back to theater critic Martin Gottfried, who first popularized the term while reviewing the musical Follies in 1971, defining it as a show whose music, lyrics, dance, stage movement, and dialogue are woven through each other in the creation of a tapestry-like theme rather than in support of a plot. 
This can make categorizing what exactly a concept musical is quite difficult, for it appears, quote, so slippery in its form that it is indefinable. But you know one when you see one, end quote. While the subject matter and style may vary, the concept musical is often split into two intermingling categories. The first might be likened to director's theater, where the director author decides what the work is to be about and then attempts to have it reflected in all aspects of the production. The second type of concept musical abandons a linear plot in favor of a series of vignettes unified by theme. In other words, the overlying mission statement of the musical is evident in every aspect of the production and takes precedence over a standard direct narrative. By moving the focus away from realistic storytelling, the concept musical is able to play with ideas like minimalist aesthetics and non-linear storytelling and the incorporation of different theatrical styles. Although the concept musical was popularized during the 1960s, there were earlier attempts at fashioning conventional Broadway musicals around a theme. After solidifying the structure of the modern Broadway book musical with 1943's Oklahoma, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein II had their first flop with the highly conceptual Allegro in 1947. The following year, Kurt Weill would combine his Brechtian songwriting style with a lowless Alan J. Lerner to create their allegory on marriage. Love Life. Both Allegro and Love Life were musicals that expressed an idea through abstract theatricality. But in the era of Golden Age book musicals, both would fall by the wayside when it came to cultural relevance. It wasn't until the mid 1960s, as the popularity of Broadway waned, that more creators were willing to take chances and experiment with what could be done on stage in a mainstream musical. So there are four shows from the 1960s that encapsulate the varying degrees of concept musical styles Cabaret, Fiddler on the Roof, Man of La Mancha, and Hair. And while there are certainly more that could be analyzed, it is these four that made the most impact, would lay the groundwork for the concept musical renaissance of the 1970s, and are still popular to this day. Cabaret was an award-winning smash that is seen as a turning point in musical theater history, as it opened the door for more experimental works to exist within the Broadway mainstream. With music by John Kander, lyrics by Fred Ebb, a book by Joe Masteroff, and conceived and directed by Harold Hal Prince. Hal, it's about catch. Cabaret is an adaptation of John Van Druten's 1951 play, I Am a Camera, which was itself adapted from Christopher Isherwood's novel, Goodbye to Berlin. The musical takes place in 1930s Germany, just as the Third Reich is rising to power, and it presents the audience with two dual narratives. The first, set in the real world, tells the story of American novelist Cliff Bradshaw, who moves into a Berlin boarding house encountering a cast of colorful characters, most notably nightclub performer and free speaker spirit, Fräulein Sally Bowles. The second story takes place in the world of the Kit Kat Club, which Hal Prince famously defined as Limbo. The songs in Limbo slash Kit Kat Club are all performed diegetically by the garish MC and a bevy of unappealing chorus girls, yet they directly comment on the actions taking place in the real world. Now there are a few important factors that define Cabaret specifically as a concept musical. The first is that the show's concept comes from Hal Prince, who worked in tandem with Kander, Ebb, and Masteroff through multiple drafts. This would continue a marked shift from previous generations, when librettists and songwriters would craft a show and just send it to a Broadway director and choreographer to mount. The second would be in the show's innovative set design by Boris Aronson. Prince was heavily influenced by the Taganka theater techniques of Soviet Russia, particularly their dramatic use of lighting as a curtain. Aronson adapted this idea of a curtain of light and utilized it to differentiate the real world from limbo. Quote, to keep the two areas separate throughout the show, they built a curtain of footlights six feet back from the edge of the stage, which came on only when the MC performed and thus obliterated the real world behind. Only one time in the show were the two areas connected and with a symbolism intended to be devastating." End quote. Among Aronson's other contributions were an iron staircase where characters from the limbo world would observe the goings on of the real world, thus adding a metatextual layer to the show, and his legendary tilted mirror, which was hung over the Kit Kat Club stage and reflected not the performers, but the audience. 
It forced members of the audience to be aware of themselves, not only as voyeurs, but also as participants in the cabaret. And thus it urged them to see a parallel between themselves and those Germans who tacitly observed Nazi horrors. The third factor that made cabaret a concept musical was the concept itself. For according to Prince, he and his team were crafting a musical not about Cliff or the seductive Sally Bowles. The girl is an irresponsible breath of life and a good character, but the show is about the rise of the National Socialist Party in Germany and the rise of Nazism. And we made it. And we made a hit out of it. Therefore, the creative team infused the insidious growth of Nazism into every element of the production. Many of the Kit Kat Club numbers, when divorced from the show, seem harmless enough, a pastiche to the jazzy Brechtian world of 1920s Berlin. Yet the dramaturgical context and subtext present otherwise. The opening number, Willkommen, gives us one of Broadway's most famous opening vamps. But also, subtle clues of danger in the staging. The triumphant cabaret is made less so when you know it ends with Sally Bowles choosing to get an abortion. And the infamous If You Could See Her starts with the MC performing a hilariously romantic dance with a gorilla and ends with the lyric, If You Could See Her Through My Eyes. She wouldn't look Jewish at all. <laughs> The audience, at first laughing at the absurdity of the Gorilla MC act, are hit with a sucker punch of a reality check by the song's end. Indeed, Kander and Ebb did their job as songwriters so well that this final jarring lyric was altered to she wouldn't look mischkeit at all in its earliest incarnations, while the act one finale, Tomorrow Belongs to Me, has often been misinterpreted as an actual Nazi anthem. By utilizing new techniques from dramaturgy to concept to design, Cabaret reclaimed the theater's oldest essential going back to the Greeks to challenge the public, make it rethink its first principles. Backtracking two years to 1964, Broadway was introduced to a musical that fused both golden age and modern concept musical styles, Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler is one of Broadway's most successful musicals, being the first in history to surpass 3,000 performances, winning nine Tony Awards, and experiencing a healthy post-Broadway life in community theaters and high schools. With a book by Joseph Stein and music by the Pulitzer Prize-winning team of Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach, Fiddler on the Roof has been admired across generations and even the world. Indeed, it has been debated for years whether Fiddler even counts as a concept musical, as it has a coherent story and fits well into the book musical traditions of the Golden Age. Based on Shalem Alechem's Tevye stories of the late 1890s and early 1900s, particularly the short story collection Tevye's Daughters, Fiddler on the Roof tells the tale of a poor milkman who lives in the early 20th century Russian Jewish village of Anna Tevka with his wife and five daughters. There is little plot, however, the main conflict arises from Tevye's eldest daughters and the romantic matches they make. The first daughter marries for love, the second falls for a revolutionary from out of town, and and the third daughter defies tradition by marrying outside her faith. How does a story so simple capture the hearts of multiple generations? What is this show about anyway? That was the question posited to the creative team by Fiddler's director choreographer, Jerome Robbins. By 1964, Robbins was coming to the end of a decades long career directing iconic musicals like On the Town, West Side Story, and Gypsy to name a few. During Fiddler's writing process, Robbins was perpetually asking the question, what is this show about? After many meetings, the creative team had a breakthrough. According to lyricist Sheldon Harnick, It's about the changing of the way of life of a people in these Eastern European communities, these little towns, these shtetls. And Robbins got very excited about that. He said, if that's the case, then what you have to write is a number about traditions, because we're going to see those traditions change. Every scene, or every other scene, will be about whether a tradition changes or whether a tradition remains the same. Robin, Stein, Bach, and Harnick sought to imbue Jewish traditions into every element of the show, establishing what they were from the opening number, aptly titled Tradition, to the somber Sabbath prayer, 
to the first act finale, which presents the audience with a Jewish wedding and a thrilling bottle dance. Tradition was infused into the choreography, represented with folk-like circle patterns of dance, and into the set design, again by Boris Aronson. Visually, Fiddler on the Roof was non-traditional. It was expressionistic. Boris Aronson's scene design took its inspiration from the paintings of Russian Jewish painter Marc Chagall, whose imagery inspired the title. Fiddler's concept is so pervasive that the embodiment of tradition can be found in the character of the Fiddler himself. The musical starts with him sitting upon a roof and playing the theme to tradition. And throughout the musical, he appears to Tevya, playing his alluring melody, especially at moments when Tevya's beliefs are being challenged. In the second act, traditions begin to fall apart when all the residents of Anatevka are expelled by the Russian government, sending them on a diaspora to find a new home. The fiddler is there to the end, as the stage directions describe in this final moment. Tevya stops, turns, beckons to him. The fiddler tucks his violin under his arm and follows the family upstage as the curtain falls. Their traditions will continue, for the fiddler is with Tevya and his family, but it will not be in their ancestral home. Thus, the fiddler joins Tevya on his journey, because the fiddler is tradition, something portable that Tevya can take along till Messiah comes. While Fiddler on the Roof tells the story of an early 20th century Russian Jewish community, the gradual disillusion of tradition is the musical's universal appeal. Stein would often recount that at a rehearsal for the Tokyo production, a local producer asked him how the show could have been a hit in America when it was so Japanese. The relatability across cultures is twofold. First, there were Tevye's daughters, the modern children challenging their parents' stayed ways. And second, the anti-Semitic persecution of the people of Anatevka presented a reality where their very heritage was in danger of disappearing. Persecution of marginalized communities and the fear of losing traditions tied to one's heritage is something many communities can relate to. The universal appeal derives from the specificity of the story. Thanks to Jerome Robbins relentlessly asking, what is this show about? We have one of the first instances of a mainstream post-Golden Age musical that, quote, embodied an overriding idea that could unify and conceptualize a show, end quote. Man of La Mancha is a unique musical with layers upon layers of metaphors with its show within a show concept. La Mancha originally opened at Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut in 1965, then made a transfer to an off-Broadway venue the same year and eventually making it to multiple proper Broadway venues by 1968. Like Fiddler before it, Man of La Mancha would become one of the longest running and successful musicals of the 1960s. Because the show was created out of town, the entire creative team were Broadway novices, with music by Mitch Lee, lyrics by Joe Darian, and a book by Dale Wasserman. The musical opens with legendary novelist Miguel de Cervantes, captured by the Spanish Inquisition and thrown into prison for the crime of foreclosing on a Catholic monastery. The inmates set up something of a mock trial, and Cervantes must convince his fellow prisoners not to destroy the manuscript of his novel. So he enacts it with their help. Cervantes dons full makeup and becomes Alonso Quijana, an aging country squire who convinces himself that he is Don Quixote, a medieval knight. Man of La Mancha broke with Broadway tradition by taking place in real time with no intermission, in one location, and on a thrust stage. The set, designed by Howard Bay, was a bleakly realistic recreation of a medieval prison, complete with an ominous drawbridge. It is up to the actors, aka Cervantes and the prisoners, to use their imaginations, and by extension the audiences, to create the environment in which the Don Quixote story plays out. We see parallels to Cabaret in this sense, where we have a real world and a world in limbo, or in this case an imaginary world. The musical unfolded by juxtaposing the real story of the first, which was not sung, and the imagined story of the second, which was. It would have been simple enough to adapt Don Quixote into a musical, but by adding the Cervantes element, the show's foray into concept musical territory becomes evident. After all, we're working with a musical here where the audience witnesses actor Richard Kiley. <laughs> we spared no expense. 
portraying Miguel de Cervantes, who then takes up the role of Alonso Quijana, who thinks he is a medieval knight named Don Quixote. What themes could be mined from this many levels of metatextuality? Uh, the movie Split. The movie Splash. Well, there are two concepts that emerge when analyzing Man of La Mancha. The first is the concept of reality versus idealism. Cervantes is seeking an escape from the harsh reality he finds himself in, so he retreats to play-acting Don Quixote with his fellow inmates. Yet the story of Don Quixote itself is about a man who is denying his reality and chooses to dream the impossible dream and reach the unreachable. With a few exceptions, the songs of the show set forth either an idealist position or the realities that idealism must confront, all in fairly direct terms. Therefore, this first concept becomes about the need for idealism when faced with brutish realism. The second concept, which builds off the first, is about the power that performance holds. When Cervantes becomes Quixote, he does so by opening a makeup kit on stage, applying it to his face in full view of the audience, and transforming into his alter ego right before their eyes. In the Quixote narrative, our protagonist's nemesis is the Enchanter, aka the Knight of Mirrors, who fights Quixote not with swords, but with his own reflection. Quixote is forced to confront who he truly is, country squire Alonso, thus bringing about the character's mental breakdown. Immediately following this moment, the imaginary world is momentarily broken when Cervantes is informed that his time has come to be summoned before the judges of the Inquisition. The parallels are even more apparent when, at the show's end, Don Quixote dies. And Cervantes, having finished his tale, ascends the prison stairs and confronts his fate while the cast reprises his motto song, The Impossible Dream. Quixote's tale is over, but it has inspired Cervantes to face his fear and make his play acting a veritable coping mechanism. As Wasserman puts it, the connection between Cervantes and his alter ego illustrates a universal truth that illusion is man's strongest spiritual need the most meaningful function of his imagination. Man of La Mancha, like Fiddler on the Roof, tells a linear story, and like Cabaret, presents the audience with dual narratives that enhance one another. Also like Cabaret, La Mancha takes inspiration from theatrical techniques that were out of the norm for 1960s Broadway. Minimalism, realism, European cabaret, Russian theater, etc. Cabaret's concept is that Nazism is insidious, pervasive, and could happen anywhere. Fiddler is all about tradition and the factors that bring about its erosion. Man of La Mancha tackles maintaining one's idealism in the face of harsh reality. By the time Man of La Mancha made its official Broadway transfer in 1968, though, another musical from the eclectic off-off Broadway scene was making its way to the mainstream. It was a concept musical that sought to take on every timely theme under the sun. Or rather, the sun shine. If hair has a concept, and indeed it does, it's laid out clearly in the show's full unabridged title, Hair, the American Tribal Love Rock Musical. With music by Galt McDermott and both lyrics and book co-written by Jerome Ragney and James Rado, Hair's development varies in many major ways from the other concept musicals discussed in this section. Ragney was part of the off-off Broadway theater movement that developed during the 1960s, more of that later, and would be inspired by the theatrical techniques well outside the norms of Broadway, including utilizing ensemble-based storytelling, improvisation, and workshopping to develop more experience experimental theatrical works. These techniques were fundamental in the shaping of hair, and every element of the production is intended to be subversive. Director Tom O'Horgan also came from the off-off Broadway theater scene, and after a somewhat lackluster 1967 run at Joseph Papp's Public Theater, O'Horgan overhauled the book in order to, quote, violate as many norms of Broadway showmaking as he could, end quote, as the musical made its official Broadway transfer in 1968. There is no real plot to hair. Just a tribe of hippies hanging out in Greenwich Village. One of the main characters, Claude Hooper Bukowski, has received his draft card and is conflicted with whether he should burn it or report for duty. In the end, Claude reports to the Vietnam War 
and he dies. Yet the show isn't really about recounting a plot, like I said. Like many of the concept musicals in this section, the meaning is in the message. Harris' concept is essentially everything that is the counterculture movement of the late 1960s. The late 1960s is Harris' concept. Sex is portrayed bluntly, racism is placed in the foreground, drug use is celebrated as a world-expanding experience in songs like Hashish, and a 20 minute acid trip sequence, and the frank opposition to the Vietnam War is ever present in songs like 3500, the draft card burning bee in that ends act one, and the cathartic finale, The Flesh Failures, AKA Let the Sun Shine In. Tribal free love and spiritualism is set up from the opening number, Aquarius, and the exuberance of the hippie movement is celebrated in I Got Life, and of course, the titular song. The entirety of Hare's dense score constitutes the first rock musical, for it was the first time in Broadway history that a score was composed entirely of popular, not musical theater music. Hare's concept of capturing all that was the late 1960s counterculture anti-war movement was inherent not only in the songs, but in the casting, the fluid book, and the off-off-Broadway theatrical techniques. After the musical's watered down run at the public theater with actors playing hippies, O'Horgan went the opposite route for Broadway and sought to cast real hippies for his actors, particularly hippies who could sing rock music convincingly. While not totally unheard of for a musical's writers to star in their work, Golden Age lyricists Betty Comden and Adolph Green were known to perform their own shows, Hare also broke from the norm by casting Rado as Claude and Ragney as his psychedelic teddy bear id, Burger. O'Horgan was adamant about the constant breaking of the fourth wall, having the actors connect directly with the audience. In fact, it's a time-honored tradition in every production, including mine, for the cast to invite the audience on stage to take part in the ritualistic singing of Let the Sunshine In during the finale. When I played Jeannie, I had the opportunity to improvise with the audience near the end of Act One, inviting them into my living room and making every performance a little different. Musical theater historian Larry Stemple's description of Hare's innovative techniques sums up the whole experience perfectly. The in-your-face performance environment with actors mingling with the audience, the anti-illusionist devices such as performers using handheld microphones when they sang, the free flow of profanity throughout, and in an infamous moment at the end of the first act, full frontal nudity, all serve to assault establishment senses and sensibilities. But the new production seemed so innocent and like such a breath of fresh air on Broadway that audiences there, and then audiences everywhere, simply could not get enough. Hare's audience wasn't meant to sit back and relax. They were to be challenged from every angle, from structure to theatrical techniques to subject matter. In his historical and textual analysis of Hare, Scott Miller defines the show as one of the few pure concept musicals, and it certainly differs from conceptual shows that came before it. The core mission statement of We Are the Hippie Counterculture of the 1960s is the musical's primary concern, so the actors, situations, reality, and linear narrative can all fluctuate in service of this message. Concept musicals were not new when the 1960s came about but they simply hadn't been profitable or mainstream. As the relevance of Broadway music declined, however, its creators decided to take more risks. What was permissible in a Broadway musical was beginning to evolve as shows began to play with concepts, laying the groundwork for a kind of concept musical renaissance in the 1970s. Fiddler on the Roof could be seen as passing the torch between the eras, blending golden age musical techniques with new theatrical innovations. Thanks to his hands-on work with Cabaret, Hal Prince continued to push the boundaries of what musical theater could do during the famous Prince Sondheim era of the 1970s, breaking the mold with other concept shows like Company, Follies, and Pacific Overtures. Man of La Mancha's one-act structure, minimalist aesthetics, and commentary on an artist's connection to their art has been echoed in popular concept musicals like Assassins, A Chorus Line, and Sunday in the Park with George. Finally, while there was a rock musical boom with the works of Andrew Lloyd Webber and the British invasion of Broadway in the 1970s and 80s, Hare's bohemian style and cult status is most perfectly represented by the 1996 musical phenomenon, Rent. The Broadway auteurs, 
During the golden age of Broadway, the creators of a musical were unequivocally the composer, lyricist, and book writer. Tin Pan Alley songwriters like Cole Porter and Irving Berlin, and the godfathers of the modern book musical Rodgers and Hammerstein, had their names tower above show titles. The librettists were the guaranteed hit makers, the names known in every home, whereas directors and choreographers were merely conduits for the writer's vision. In the 1960s, though, we saw a marked shift in power. Directors and choreographers were becoming one and the same, and instead of having a script handed off to them, they now collaborated with the writers of a show from its inception rather than wait until the rehearsal period to stage what the writers had already written. These Broadway auteurs would see a musical as the sum of its parts. Storytelling, music, dance, and acting were integral to the entire piece. The decade of the 1960s began with a book based structure in musical theater and had evolved to a concept oriented vision of the director choreographer by the decade's end. For this section, we will focus on four of the decade's most influential auteurs, Jerome Robbins, Hal Prince, Gower Champion, and Bob Fosse. Hal Prince and Jerome Robbins were discussed in the previous section, for they both played a major hand in the development of concept musicals, and their stories are inextricably intertwined. By the late 1950s, Robbins had already established himself as the template for the successful director-choreographer. He started in the world of ballet, then segued to Broadway, where he worked on multiple projects with prolific director George Abbott, including 1944's On the Town. It's with On the Town where we see Robbins' first inklings of becoming a Broadway auteur, for he worked closely with the creative team of Betty Comden and Adolph Green and Leonard Bernstein to integrate dance into the book from the musical's inception. After choreographing and co-directing multiple big-name musicals, Jerome Robbins began pulling double duty as both director and choreographer in 1954's Peter Pan. He followed this up by directing and choreographing two of the greatest masterpieces of the golden age of Broadway, West Side Story in 1957 and Gypsy in 1959. Robbins' balletic style is instantly iconic, and he began to incorporate dance into every element of the production. For example, in West Side Story, Robbins, quote, shaped his dances around around the character's natural movements. Thus, dancing in West Side Story was no longer physically separable from the rest of the production as the show moved with kinetic fluency from one scene to the next, end quote. Jerome Robbins was not an easy man to work with. <laughs> His perfectionism and dedication to research labeled him as a method director with a dictatorial approach, which was not uncommon for director-choreographer auteurs at the time. Robbins believed that from choreography to characterization, it is up to the director to ensure that all the pieces of the puzzle come together and boldly put forth a single vision to which the company can adhere. As Robbins himself explains, I know that one of the things I work so hard for is to find the best way to communicate the clearest thing to the audience, so that the audience will receive the same impact, or the strongest impact, whether it's a comedy point, a nuance, that it is clear to them. If it's not clear to them, then why all this bother? It's no good doing it for yourself. Robbins was not afraid to tell the truth and ask probing questions. This ability gave him a successful side gig as a show doctor in the early 1960s, where he would assist on major productions that were floundering on their way to Broadway. Robbins' show doctor role would include ghost directing or choreographing, as he did with Funny Girl in 1964, or simply coming in as a consultant to make suggestions. This is most famously laid out when Robbins was brought in to assist with A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and he informed the creative team that the reason the opening number wasn't working out of town was because it gave no inclination as to the show the audience was about to see. Thus, the vague and light Love is in the Air was replaced with the body and brassy comedy tonight. West Side Story, however, was when Jerome Robbins set the stage for the Broadway auteurs who would follow in the 1960s. And this is for two main reasons. The first reason is that West Side Story was based on a conception of the same person who choreographed slash directed it. That person being Jerome Robbins. Because of this, Robbins' choreography is so connected to West Side Story that it's not legally possible to do the show without it. And it explains why you see those snapping fingers in every version. We'll see what the Spielberg movie looks like. The Robbins model of direction would be fully realized with his final original Broadway work, Fiddler on the Roof, where the dancing is so specific to the ethnic group being portrayed that it's nearly impossible to take the choreography out of context. 
Fiddler demonstrated that stylized dance was outdated and must be placed strictly within the action of a musical piece. This template of fully integrated dance and complete involvement was emulated by many successful Broadway auteurs of the 1960s and 70s. The second reason West Side Story was a pivotal moment for Broadway auteurs was because it was co-produced by Hal Prince. It's no stretch to say that Hal Prince is one of the most important directors to work in the medium of musical theater, as his career spanned multiple decades and he ushered forth some of the most successful masterpieces in Broadway history. Besides his aforementioned collaboration with Stephen Sondheim, which moved the medium towards more introspective work in the 1970s, Prince also helped solidify the British mega musical boom of the 1980s by directing some of Andrew Lloyd Webber's greatest hits like Evita and Phantom of the Opera. Hal Prince was so prolific, he was directing Broadway musicals through the 1990s and 2000s, even directing a musical review based on his extensive catalog in 2015 titled Prince of Broadway, his last directing credit before passing away in 2019. The Broadway musical landscape simply doesn't look the way it does today without the influence of Hal Prince. Prince got his start producing musicals in the 1950s, many of them directed by George Abbott and choreographed by Jerome Robbins, two of his greatest directing influences. Abbott taught him discipline, a zero tolerance policy for histrionics and self-indulgence, and a striving for truth beyond a shadow of a doubt. From Robbins, he learned dynamics and staging. When Prince came on board to co-produce West Side Story, not only was he introduced to a young Stephen Sondheim, his future collaborator of the 1970s, but he was able to witness Jerome Robbins' graceful segue into a director-choreographer. Prince also learned from Robbins the kind of director he did not want to be, as Robbins was notorious for his vitriolic approach, while Prince shies away from contention and trusts that his actors will bring the necessary subtext to their performance. Yet Hal Prince believed in Jerome Robbins implicitly as an artistic force, so much so that he would produce Robbins' magnum opus, Fiddler on the Roof. Observing Robbins' work for Fiddler was another monumental step, for he exposed Prince to the idea of basing a musical on a concept, an idea Prince would expand upon when he began work on Cabaret. Having been mentored by some of the most important directors of the late 1950s, Hal Prince would finally get his chance at directing in the early 60s. His first attempt was with the musical A Family Affair, which flopped, followed by the modest cult hit She Loves Me, the forgettable Baker Street, and the campy It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman. It was with 1966's Cabaret, though, where Prince made his mark and helped to establish the permanence of the modern concept musical. For Prince, the importance of all-encompassing preparation before even stepping foot in a rehearsal room is vital to the success of a Broadway auteur. Preparation is getting everything you need to know of a sensory nature about the characters, where the story is taking place, all those things. I mean, what things smell like, taste like, sound like, and so on. When you see a musical with Hal Prince's name on it, you know he's involved in every aspect of the production, either directly or through collaboration with the creative team. It is worth noting that, unlike the other directors discussed in this section, Prince does not have choreographer attached to his name, and instead he is labeled a director-producer. There are few musicals after Cabaret that Prince produced without also directing, adding another layer to the all-encompassing involvement of the Broadway auteur. Gower Champion and Bob Fosse had similar career trajectories that led them to becoming Broadway auteurs. As opposed to Jerome Robbins, who came from the world of ballet, Champion and Fosse both started out as Broadway hoofers, or more commercial musical theater style dancers. They both attempted a career in Hollywood movie musicals during the 1950s. Champion is half of a dancing team with his wife, Marge, and Fosse, who had dreams of becoming the next Fred Astaire. Neither Fosse nor Champion found much success in Hollywood, especially as movie musicals were becoming passe. So both returned to Broadway in the late 1950s and began working as Broadway choreographers. Despite their similar career paths, both men had their own distinct styles. According to Stemple, Champion gravitated to the elegance of the ballroom and the supper club. Fosse to the sleaze of strip joints and burlesque. Champion was already a Tony-winning choreographer for his work in 1948's Lendoneer, but in the 1960s, he directed and choreographed four successful hit music in a row, all of which were innovative in their own ways. The first was 1960's Bye Bye Birdie.
Birdie, which told the story of an Elvis-like rock star named Conrad Birdie, who is about to be inducted into the army. But before he reports for duty, he is sent to a small town in Ohio to kiss one of his teenaged fans as a publicity stunt for the Ed Sullivan Show. Birdie is notable for having a score that consists of the first rock and roll pastiche music to grace a Broadway stage, for the introduction of Dick Van Dyke to the musical theater world for his portrayal of Birdie's nervous manager, and for solidifying champion style, particularly his unique stage designs and his penchant for tableau. Champion was the master of the stage picture and the themes that could be evoked by it, as evidenced in Bye Bye Birdie's The Telephone Hour, where an ensemble of teens are isolated from each other on a massive honeycomb set, alone in their pods, but connected by their phones. Relatable content. After Birdie came 1961's Carnival, a musical about a French circus troupe, which was innovative for its unit set, eliminating the need for conventional set changes and allowing a continuous, almost cinematic flow of action, while also allowing circus performers to flow freely through the audience, making the entire Broadway house the performance space. Then in 1964 came the Broadway behemoth known as Hello Dolly. Hello, Dolly! is an adaptation of Thornton Wilder's The Matchmaker, with a book by Michael Stewart and music and lyrics by Jerry Herman. The show takes place in 1890s New York and tells the story of a middle-aged widow named Dolly Gallagher-Levi, who works as a matchmaker to various couples, including her own to millionaire curmudgeon Horace Vandergelder. Without the Gower Champion stamp, Hello Dolly would have likely been one of the last gasps of the Golden Age style musical comedy, for its narrative and characters are fairly straightforward. However, Dolly was one of the biggest smash hits of the 1960s. It won multiple Tony Awards, including for Champion, ran for well over 2,000 performances, and when Louis Armstrong covered the title track, it shot to the top of the music charts. Yet it was Champion's spin on the song Hello Dolly which truly encapsulated how how well he made the show work. In the middle of act two, Dolly returns to her favorite restaurant, the Harmonia Gardens, after being away for many years. Upon her return at the top of an ornate staircase, feathers in her hair, the waiters celebrate Dolly's return with song and dance. A simple enough concept on the surface, but this number alone is what prompted Hal Prince to lose out on directing the show. After being pitched the title song by composer Jerry Herman, Prince responded, with all the arrogance I had no difficulty mustering, I said, <laughs> Are you crazy? What's this number doing here? This is nonsense. <laughs> Read the play. Hal Prince couldn't wrap his mind around it, but luckily, Gower Champion, the master of the stage picture, knew how to make Hello Dolly work, which he pulled off in three major ways. The first was in the set design, which involved a runway that wrapped around the orchestra pit. The second was in how Champion allowed the song to build in intensity and exuberance until Dolly and the waiters simply have to cakewalk on that runway, coming ever closer to the audience. Third, and probably the most subtly innovative, was in how Champion was very much aware of how to manipulate an audience. Hello Dolly may be a traditional musical in some respects, but it also takes moments to wink at the audience and at the musical comedy genre in general. Therefore, in the end, it didn't really matter if the song was motivated by the plot or not because audiences would consistently stand up and cheer for an encore, champion obliged. As Stemple puts it, Champion's gift for staging such artifice here and throughout the show ultimately made Hello Dolly the extraordinary hit it turned out to be. In 1964, having a modern musical that fell back on the razzle-dazzle traditions that predated the Golden Age was positively subversive, and Champion was recognized for his work by being the first director-choreographer to receive top billing over a Broadway musical. Gower Champion's last successful musical of the 1960s was I Do, I Do, an intimate concept musical which only had two cast members and featured vignettes of a couple throughout 50 years of marriage. It is in 1966, the year of Champion's last hit, where we see Bob Fosse make his official debut as a director-choreographer with the musical Sweet Charity. Before Charity, Fosse spent the 1950s and early 60s being mentored by some of Broadway's greatest directors through his work as a choreographer, including his very first job for co-directors George Abbott and Jerome Robbins in The Pajama Game. What followed was a string of successful musical comedies where Fosse refined his technique, incorporating vaudeville, burlesque, and modern dance to create a singular style, with a Fosse dance, bowler hats, and jazz hands intermingled with awkward angles, minimalism, and 
winking sexuality. He choreographs everything from the flick of a wrist to the roll of an eye. When Fosse met his future wife, Broadway star Gwen Verdon, working on the musical Damn Yankees in 1955, he found the perfect muse to channel his unique choreography. Fosse and Verdon would collaborate on New Girl in Town and Redhead, but as the 1960s wore on, Verdon's star was fading and Fosse was restless for more control. In order to make his mark as a director choreographer, Fosse had to sink his interests and plug the whole package into Gwen. And thus, Sweet Charity was born. Based on Federico Fellini's 1957 film, Knights of Cabiria, Sweet Charity features a book by Neil Simon, music by Cy Coleman, lyrics by Dorothy Fields, and Bob Fosse is credited as director, choreographer, and conceiver for the very first time in his career. The musical is made up of a series of vignettes centered around a nightclub taxi dancer looking for love, and this theme is broadcast to the audience with huge signs from the very beginning that read, The Adventures of Charity, the story of a girl who wanted to be loved. In her search for love, Charity goes on a series of misadventures that capture the mid-1960s zeitgeist in a way most musicals didn't attempt until the end of the decade. The nightclub taxi dancers leer dead-eyed in the pulsing big spender. Charity's many solo sequences are evocative of go-go dancing, and we even encounter hippies on Broadway in the tribal rhythm of life, two full years before Hair made the attempt. The real innovations of Sweet Charity, though, come from Bob Fosse's approach as director-choreographer. Fosse, like Jerome Robbins, was a no notorious perfectionist. Yet Fosse's frustrations over perfection usually stemmed from his own insecurities. I can't stand mediocrity. When I go to the theater, myself, or, or sloppiness in any way, I think I have a dreadful fear within myself that there's a great streak of mediocrity in me and a great streak of laziness. I'm so afraid that this sense that I have in myself, this indolent streak that I have will take over, that I work twice as hard. Fosse always wanted more say in the projects he worked on, and with Sweet Charity, he had his first shot at near total control. Charity was pivotal in separating Fosse's earlier shows with their reliance on book-based narratives from his later ones, centered on concepts in which dance was the most important element. Fosse's dance style had been evolving since the 1950s, but it was in Sweet Charity when his directorial trademarks became apparent and his inkling towards the cinematic. Teeming with stylized fourth wall breaking touches, the silent film-like titles, zippy scene changes, and iris in techniques to create close-up effects. Fosse's grand concept, his directorial style, was a fractured thing in pieces. It was edited. Indeed, with every subsequent project throughout the 1970s, Fosse's influence would be all-encompassing. He further developed his vignette dance show storytelling techniques, as well as his vaudevillian pastiches throughout the 1970s in musicals like Pippin and Chicago. And by 1978, he did away with the book musical structure altogether with the dance-based show Dancin'. Fosse's flair for cinematic storytelling led him back to Hollywood, where he made his directorial debut with Sweet Charity's 1969 film adaptation. And in 1972, Fosse took the reins away from Hal Prince when he adapted Cabaret for Film, famously eliminating all the songs in the real world narrative and only keeping the songs from Limbo. This proved a wise decision though, as movie musicals were out of popularity by the 1970s and required subversion of an already subversive musical to be effective. The risk paid off as Fosse won an Oscar for Best Direction for his work on Cabaret. In looking at these four 1960s Broadway auteurs, we can see specific ways in which they influenced future generations of director-choreographers. Jerome Robbins set the precedent for a director-choreographer also conceiving a show. Hal Prince stressed the importance of rigorous research and preparation. Gower Champion knew the power of a good stage picture. And Bob Fosse sought to tell primarily dance-based stories on stage. All four of these men had their hands in developing the modern concept musical. And both Prince and Fosse would have major success producing more experimental concept shows in the 1970s. These Broadway auteurs understood that the book and score were only a part of the picture, for it was the director who coalesced all the necessary elements into a cohesive vision. Outside the Broadway Bubble 
1960s musical theater was changing not only in its style and influences, but also in the stories that were allowed to be told on Broadway in the first place. Thanks to the popularity of Broadway musicals and the Tin Pan Alley composers who wrote them, the bubble for new musical theater works existed solely in New York City as far back as the early 1900s. Yet in the midst of the golden age of the 1950s, new theater movements were rising in influence and popularity. By the 1960s, off-Broadway musicals could exist and thrive on their own terms, focusing more on the craft than on commerce. The counterculture off-off-Broadway scene would take this concept to new heights by the end of the decade with their ensemble-based techniques. The 1960s would see a burgeoning theater movement throughout the United States, and new regional musicals could make a Broadway transfer. In fact, regional musicals could traverse not only the country, but across the pond, as we see the first British musicals relocated from the West End to become Broadway classics. In order to discuss off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway, regional theater, and and West End musicals, we will look at two musicals already touched upon, Hair and Man of La Mancha, as well as The Fantastics and Oliver. From the 1900s through the early 1950s, the theater that quote mattered in New York City was only produced on Broadway. However, there was plenty of entertainment to be found in the off-Broadway houses located in the Bohemian Greenwich Village in Manhattan. It was off-Broadway where during the 1910s and 20s, various companies were formed in the interest of producing more socially conscious theater. In the 1930s, in the midst of the Great Depression, the Federal Theater Project was founded and produced government-funded works of art, including 1937's controversial, too socialist for Broadway labor opera, The Cradle Will Rock. Off-Broadway was not geared towards mainstream hits or making money, though, and throughout the 1940s, the landscape was littered with experimental plays, revivals of popular 1920s shows, and musical reviews. It was during the 1950s, though, that the off-Broadway scene began to flourish with the 1952 revival of Tennessee Williams' Summer and Smoke at Circle in the Square Theater. The original production flopped on Broadway, but in an off-Broadway house with an unconventional thrust stage, the production was able to find new life and attract a mainstream audience. This was followed by a wildly successful revival of Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill's The Three Penny Opera in 1954. The original Broadway production closed after only 12 performances in 1933, but would thrive with well over 2,000 performances in the off-Broadway iteration 20 years later. With its socialist tone and haunting score, the Three Penny Opera helped define what the alternative venue could offer, intimacy that was also somewhat confrontational, a hard edge that was still entertaining, and a spare production that was highly professional. The show was not a Broadway musical done in a small space. It was an off Broadway musical. The success of shows like the Three Penny Opera set the stage for Off-Broadway to finally have its defining musical theater moment in the 1960s, starting off with the Fantastics. The songwriting team of Harvey Schmidt and Tom Jones were entrenched in the world of off-Broadway in the 1950s. Both were living in Greenwich Village and throwing together original musical reviews at nightclubs like Upstairs at the Downstairs. Indeed, the team even penned a song for one of their reviews titled Mr. Off-Broadway, featuring Jones's lyrics, which perfectly capture off-Broadway of the late 50s. Everybody calls me Mr. Off-Broadway. Yes, everybody shouts it when we meet although nobody knows me on the great white way still i'm very well respected south of 14th street in 1959 schmidt and jones were commissioned to write a one-act musical for a season of summer stock out of barnard college so they adapted a romeo and juliet style story they had been working on for years Producer Lore Noto saw the piece and urged them to flesh it out into two acts for an off-Broadway run. So, the book was drastically overhauled and became an adaptation of Edmund Rosten's Les Romanesques evolving into The Fantastics. The Fantastics tells the story of a girl and boy falling in love and their parents who, in a brilliant move of reverse psychology, build a wall between their homes in order to facilitate their romance, believing that to manipulate children, you merely say no. The first act presents the audience with a fairy tale of young love, and the second act forces our characters to face the realities of what happens after Happily Ever After. I know, a good like two decades before Into the Woods, am I right? 
Unencumbered by the demands of Broadway, Schmidt and Jones were able to think outside the box in their creation of the Fantastics and incorporate theatrical styles not often seen in musical theater. They pulled heavily from the traditions of Commedia dell'arte, with the cast presenting itself as a troupe of actors from the start, complete with a prop box and costume pieces placed about the bare stage. As Tom Jones explains, his text is written in heightened, stylized language. I had this passion for presentational theater. The theater of Shakespeare and Thornton Wilder, Brecht, the Greeks, and thought nobody's ever going to do this damn thing anyway, I decided to write almost all of it in verse. Like Shakespeare choosing the places to use rhymed couplets. Minimalism was evident in every aspect of the production, from the eight-person cast to the lone pianist as accompaniment. Another major inspiration was Thornton Wilder's Our Town, from which Jones borrowed the idea of a narrator who has the ability to step out of time and address the audience, as the narrator character El Gallo does throughout the Fantastics. The story is intentionally simple and allegorical, with songs like Try to Remember opening the show with imagery of the changing seasons, or with our teenage ingenue singing her I Want song about much more. Specifically, what she wants more of is unclear, but you know, such is the way of teenagers. I am special. I am special. Please, God, please, don't let me be normal. The lack of specificity gives the Fantastics a universality that appeals to all audiences. Without establishing a clear sense of time or place or even meaning, the Fantastics leaves more to the imagination than it gives, turning its theme about the nature of illusion and reality into the method for staging the show. The show opened at the Sullivan Street Theater in May of 1960, an off-Broadway venue with under 150 seats, and proceeded to run for 40 two years. With the original production running well over 17,000 performances, The Fantastics is the world's longest running musical. The small cast and minimal costs are to thank for the show's longevity, but also the universality of the piece itself makes it incredibly accessible. In many ways, The Fantastics is the Ur musical. It's been produced throughout the country at colleges, high schools, and community theaters throughout the years, and the show's continued success throughout the decades proves that there was a space in New York City for mini music. Musicals. Because of the Fantastics, Off-Broadway would become a haven for more intimate shows throughout the 1960s, with musicals like You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, and Dames at Sea becoming hits. And in the decades to follow, many Off-Broadway musicals would transfer or be remounted on Broadway, such as Godspell, Little Shop of Horrors, Rent, Avenue Q, and Hamilton. The Fantastics has never been produced in a Broadway house, which is a testament to how much better the show works in an intimate space with minimal sets and costumes. In the late 1960s, though, another musical would move from off-Broadway to Broadway proper, yet its roots were in the experimental off-off-Broadway scene. This show would, of course, be hair. If Off-Broadway was creeping towards the mainstream in the 1960s, Off-Off-Broadway was actively trying to avoid it. As already discussed in the concept musical section, Hair evolved from this world where companies like The Living Theater, La Mama Experimental Theater Club, and Cafe Sino were facilitating more avant-garde theater in 1950s and 60s Greenwich Village. Indeed, Cafe Sino was seen as the crux of the movement beginning in earnest in 1958, as coffee shop owner Joe Sino famously refused to read any of the scripts submitted to him, allowing anyone to put up a show regardless of quality. There was no pressure to make money, no pressure to get good reviews, no pressure to run long or to get big crowds, since neither was possible here. It was a radical idea in 1960, free theater that was just about art. The community continued to grow through the 1960s, and by 1963, the Open Theater was established with a mission towards producing theater based on a workshop approach that relied on group improvisation and the collective input of all involved to create theatricalized experiences rather than fixed works as such. One of the company members of the Open theater was Jerome Ragney, who introduced his friend and co-writer, James Rado, to the possibilities presented by the world of off-off-Broadway. Invigorated by a play with rock music he had just performed off-Broadway called Viet Rock, Ragney sought to adapt many of the techniques used in the production in order to craft a new rock musical. Viet Rock was an open theater project and was partly written, partly group devised through improvisation in rehearsal, and utilized many of the techniques later seen in Hair, such as stream of consciousness storytelling and the divorcing of actors from their characters. It is from this off-off-Broadway blueprint that Hair began to develop, 
eventually being selected to premiere off-Broadway at the Public Theater in 1967 as part of the New York Shakespeare Festival. This off-Broadway iteration was directed by Gerald Friedman, who revamped the show with multiple rewrites, giving the production more structure and casting somewhat inauthentic actors who resembled models more than hippies. After playing a brief stint at the Cheetah Club discotheque, though, Hare moved to Broadway's Biltmore Theater in 1968 with new director Tom O'Horgan. O'Horgan was the creative team's first choice for director, as he too came from the world of off-off-Broadway as a director for La Mama Experimental Theater Club. Hare's book was revamped yet again, returning it to its more experimental roots and doing away with much of the structure Friedman added, with O'Horgan abandoning large parts of the book and narrative in favor of emphasizing the collage-like theatricality that he saw as its underlying strength. O'Horgan and the creative team made the avant-garde musical they wanted to make, and somehow it was a mainstream smash. In the end, it is telling, though, that because Hare offered a more voyeuristic approach to the counterculture, it was a hit because it had successfully fused middle-brow entertainment values with the now fashionable appeal of alternative lifestyles. And in true anti-establishment fashion, the show was seen as a sellout of ensemble-based theater values by the off-off Broadway community. As Cafe Sino actor Michael Warren Powell put it, I was disgusted by hair because it was filled with the things that we developed. But it had been sifted down to its basic components. It was just movement, whereas for us, every gesture had meaning, a psychological meaning. There were no empty gestures, but hair was absolutely empty gestures. Beloved by the experimental theater scene or not, though, hair was influential in setting the standard that rock music and the avant-garde could be successful on a Broadway stage. 1968 is a monumental year for musicals that originated outside of Broadway, finding success there nevertheless. Hair represented the world of off and off off Broadway, while Man of La Mancha was indicative of the success of regional theater. Although Broadway was the most famous theater community, there had been a little theater movement growing since the 1910s across the United States. With the end of World War II, small nonprofit theater companies began to pop up, growing out of local conditions and serving mainly local needs, and came to be known as regional theaters. One of those regional theaters popped up in East Haddam, Connecticut called Goodspeed Opera House, which began mounting original productions starting in 1963. Man of La Mancha premiered at Goodspeed in 1965 as part of their third season. And while the unique book and score have been analyzed in the concept musical section already, the way the musical was designed was what proved so revolutionary for Broadway. La Mancha told its story within a story all upon one unit set piece, the cavernous Spanish prison designed by Howard Bay and was designed for a thrust stage rather than a Broadway proscenium. There was no obligatory rising and falling of a curtain for Goodspeed's thrust stage wouldn't allow it, and therefore the action was established and concluded entirely by lighting, also accomplished by Howard Bay. Therefore, La Mancha sought the only New York venue that could accommodate their unique set piece, so it moved off-Broadway to Anto Washington Square Theater in Greenwich Village. This 1965 transfer marked the first Goodspeed production to make it to New York. And in 1968, Man of La Mancha would become the first regional theater musical to transfer to Broadway proper, with a move to the Martin Beck Theater. The decentralization of Broadway as the birthplace of musical theater can be traced back to earlier in the decade, though, and from farther away than Connecticut. The West End has often been called the Broadway of London, but during the 1940s and 50s, there was a veritable explosion of American musicals being mounted in London. In the early 1960s, though, there was a slow shifting of the tides as the British started importing more and more of their own musical works to New York. Irma La Douce, Stop the World I Want to Get Off, and Half a Sixpence were all modest hits that originated across the pond, but the biggest smash of them all was Oliver. Oliver was written entirely by Lionel Bart and was adapted from Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, telling the familiar tale of a poor orphan boy who, in his search for a family, falls in with a group of pickpocketers in 19th century London. The show ran for over 2,000 performances in London, making it the longest running British musical at the time, and ensuring a Broadway transfer in 1963. 
Oliver is a traditional golden age book musical in many respects, no shade of concept musical here. Yet it is notable as one of the first musicals to have boiled a short but complex novel into a workable size. A trend picked up in the 1980s by fellow European mega musicals like Les Miserables and The Phantom of the Opera. Oliver's composer, lyricist, and book writer Lionel Bart was a huge inspiration for Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice in the 1970s, who, like Bart, began writing musicals with the British stage in mind. This mentality would lead to Lloyd Webber becoming one of the most successful musical theater composers in the world, with hits like Jesus Christ Superstar, Evita, and Cats, all being conceived for the West End, yet experiencing tremendous success on Broadway as well. By the end of the 1960s, it was clear that creating a new work specifically for one's unique theater community was not an impediment to making a Broadway transfer. Musicals like Hair that originated from experimental theater gave the hippie counterculture an authentic presence in mainstream theater. The Fantastics proved that an off-Broadway musical could be a generation-spanning hit without ever moving to a Broadway house. Regional works like Man of La Mancha were created with a specific community in mind and still transcended to universal appeal. Finally, hits like Oliver portended a veritable onslaught of British musicals with West End sensibilities dominating the world of Broadway. The growing momentum of new non-Broadway musicals hitting the mainstream in the 1960s made it so that, in the decades to follow and up to today, it's not uncommon for new musicals to originate outside the Broadway bubble. The rise of more experimental theater, musicals created outside the Broadway bubble, and the elevating in stature of the director-choreographer all contributed to how the structure of the Broadway musical evolved in the 1960s. Every one of these influences helped set the stage for the musicals of the 1970s, from the groundbreaking partnership of Stephen Sondheim and Hal Prince, to workshopped concept shows that defined a generation like A Chorus Line. Bob Fosse and his distinctive style would develop into Broadway legend, and while his 1975 musical Chicago was unappreciated in its time, the 1996 revival is now the second longest musical currently running on Broadway. British rock musicals emboldened by the trailblazing of Lionel Bart and Hare would break out from the West End in the 1970s and come to dominate Broadway in the 1980s. In the summer of 2019, I directed a review of 60s and 70s themed musicals with a children's theater company in Pasadena. I was adamant about including a few songs from Hair, for while I obviously couldn't do a full production with 9 to 14 year olds, I could certainly utilize some of the iconic songs for educational theater purposes. The kids loved singing Hair and Let the Sun Shine In while wearing their gaudy costume jewelry and bad wigs. And in the same review, I incorporated songs from the first Broadway musical to feature rock pastiche, Bye Bye Birdie. And if there's one evergreen in the theater, it's that teenagers will always relate to the telephone hour. Always. 1960s musicals captured a moment in the way the Broadway community likely didn't intend. The 60s zeitgeist was embodied in the risks Broadway musicals were willing to take. These golden living dreams of visions of Broadway auteurs, avant-garde artists, visionary songwriters, and innovative regional theater companies all made 1960s Broadway musicals different from what came before and set the stage for what would come after. Wow, thank you guys so much for watching yeah. our video essay on the evolution of 60s Broadway musicals. It's been a blast. I hope we talked about some of your favorite 60s musicals, but if there's anything we missed, please let us know in the comments. Yeah, and tell us why it's your favorite, and if we, you know, didn't include in our list, tell us why it should have been in there. Yeah, what 60s musicals were missing? Do you have some underrated classics or some really big tentpole ones that we missed? Yeah. Tell us, tell us, tell us. Please let us know. Yeah, and don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and let us know what other deep dive video essays you'd like us to do on Broadway history. Yeah, and if you really enjoyed it, make sure you hit that like button. Beep. Bing. And let the sun shine. Let the sun shine. Shining, the sun shining. <laughs>